good morning and uh, well, uh, warm welcome to all of you who are present on the dais and here and also who are on the Google platform. Um, we are here to cherish the memory of our beloved teacher, Professor Anada Charan Bhagavati, who has been one of our senior colleagues here. And also, he's a man of uh, tremendous anthropological knowledge. He has been a very good orator. If you listen to him, you, you feel like keep on listening to him hours together. He is very knowledgeable and amiable in nature. He, is, he has been in different uh, positions. He had his uh, PhD among the Maoris of uh, New Zealand, I think, uh, New Zealand. And uh, he had also been the vice chancellor of Dadan Arunachal University, now Rajiv Gandhi University. So a few of our friends and colleagues in the year 2021, we talked about instituting a memorial lecture, annual memorial lecture, and we appealed to our authority, the Brigade University, for granting that um, memorial lecture. And we are thankful to the university authorities, especially Dadan, Dadan Vice Chancellor, Register to have granted our prayer and thereby we started this annual memorial lecture. We started in 2021. The first uh, annual memorial lecture was delivered by Professor T.B. Subba and the next, uh, the second one last year we had 2022 on 26th of October. This time also we wanted to have it on 26th of October, but that was during our puja holidays. So we decided to reschedule it on 8th of November. And that too we had to <laughs> reschedule because of the answering um, the neck visit then. But fortunately we are lucky and we are thankful to our present speaker, invited speaker, Professor M.C. Arun Kumar from uh, Manipur University, who said, can we have it on 22nd of November? He said, yes, why not? So he accepted our invitation. And Professor Arun Kumar, he's our old acquaintance. As I said a few minutes back, he's like our saver. Whenever we call him, he's here. May it be for examination <laughs> as an expert, PhD thesis educator, and special speaker and many other like academic you know activities so we rely upon him most we welcome you sir and also madam now we are happy that honorable vice chancellor says madam jana vigovinat is here with us uh, she she was on time uh, unfortunately i forgot to remind her this morning <laughs> anyway uh, she called me back. <laughs> I said, I'm sorry, uh, we are ready. So we, we welcome you, madam. And uh, we also welcome our other um, dean, faculty of School of Education, Professor R.K. Kaur, Dr. Kailan Parwa, Professor Sartak Sangupta, my brotherly uh, Dipanjana, uh, the, uh, sorry, uh, Mohendra Datta, Madam Farida Ahmed Das, Madam Dipanjana Das, it is, uh, it is indeed uh, very nice to see you here among us after a long uh, gap. But nevertheless, uh, we are here within our own limitation, limitation of our institution. We'll keep trying to having this 
special program every year on time. Usually uh, we have decided to have it on every uh, 26th of October that's being his uh, death anniversary. So we could have it last year but because of these reasons as I said before we couldn't have it. Nevertheless I once again welcome you all. So we are going to have a good uh, listening to Professor Arun Kumar. So I wind up it here. Thank you once again. Thank you so much, uh, sir, for your welcome address. Now, in order to pay homage to uh, late Professor Anudacharan Bhagavati, I would like to request the esteemed members on the dais, as well as who are present in the house, to kindly come over the podium for lighting the lamp and for, uh, and for uh, floral tribute. Thank you. Thank you. Now I would like to request Honorable Vice Chancellor in Charge, Madam, Professor Jahnobi Gogoi, Madam, kindly to deliver a few words, and she is also the chief guest of today's program, Madam. Mm -hmm. 
नमस्कार एंड वे वेरी गुड मॉर्निंग टू एवरी वन प्रेजेंट हिया रेस्पेक्टेड प्रोफेसर एम सी अरुण कुमार फ्रम मणिपुर यूनिवार्सिटी एंड टू दिज स्पीकर रेस्पेक्टेड प्रोफेसर कौर कौर सर एक्चुअली ही वॉज लाइक माई टीचर when i was a student of this university he was uh, here as a professor in anthropology uh, so sir namaskar and uh, respected dr borua respected professor uh, chand gupta respected porida baidyo depanjana baidyo and all present here those uh, earlier who were in the same university once they were my colleague uh, then the present esteemed faculty members a respected dean <laughs> professor nita kolita borwa researchers uh, and also students my dear students friends and also uh, the invited guest and uh, if, as i have <laughs> forgotten uh, respected professor nitul gumar gogoi uh, <laughs> he was like my brother and uh, he is on the dais uh, so uh at the very outset i would like to congratulate the department of anthropology for organizing this third professor onnadasharan bhagavati memorial lecture today and uh, professor mc arun kumar from manipur university uh, the, from the department of anthropology and myanmar studies the director of myanmar studies he is here to deliver a lecture on inequality and its manifestations anthropological inquiry uh, when we are talking about professor onnadasaran bhagavati i have a memory of bhagavati sir because when i was a student here uh, during the days uh, from 1979 to 83 and 84 also i was a st uh, student uh, as a research scholar here Uh, he was here he was present here and everywhere we have seen in the meetings in the conference in the seminars we have seen bhagavati sir that tall figure among us uh, he was born in 1936 at Nal nalbari in kamrup district and professor bhagavati was a very distinguished social scientist and anthropologist as a student he was exceptionally brilliant and uh, secured first class first position in bsc uh, from guwahati university in 1956 then he um, had his msc in 1958 from calcutta university and then he got the commonwealth fellowship for doctoral studies and complete completed his phd about the maoris of northern new zealand from in 1965 from university of auckland and his phd thesis is considered as a seminal work in social science studies dibrugar university was fortunate enough to have a professor of his teacher who st stayed here for about a decade from uh, 1976 to 1985 during the initial years of the department of anthropology uh, steering this uh, department and also determined its vision and mission of the department of anthropology he also served the guwahati university as a professor of anthropology from 1985 to uh, 1992 uh, as, a, as a professor of department of anthropology and besides professor bhagavati was the person who initiated the research and other activities of icssr the institute of social science and development later came to be known as okd omiyo kumar das institute of uh, social science and development professor bhagavati was the vice chancellor of 
then Orunasan University, as it was uh, told by mm, Professor Gogoi, now Rajiv Gandhi University for five years from 1993 to 1998. He was the president of anthropology and archaeology section of Indian Science Congress in 1988. He was also the president of NEHA, that is the Organization of uh, History, Northeast India History Association in 97-98. He was uh, the Tagore National Fellow of Ministry of Culture, Government of India. And Professor Bhagavati has published a large number of research papers, more than 50 research papers, published in different research journals, renowned research journals of the world. It has been said, during our days, it has been said that uh, Professor Bhagavati was an encyclopedia of knowledge. In those days, in our days, we, we call him that like an uh, encyclopedia. It is a great pleasure on my part to be here as a chief guest, though it is accidental actually. Uh, uh, in this, in his uh, memorial lecture, in memory of Professor Onodasharan Bhagavati, by the, which is organized by the Department of Anthropology, Deprugar University. I must say that by organizing such lectures, the Department of Anthropology has done a great honor not only to Professor S. Bhagavati Sar, but also to the excellence in the academic and intellectual pursuits of the nation. The department, therefore, deserves commendation from the entire university community. I wish the lecture will explore many more things in recent researches in the discipline of anthropology and thereby enrich our knowledge. Once more, I accord my thanks to the Department of Anthropology uh, for organizing this lecture and also for inviting me as a chief guest to this uh, um, gathering. Thank you very much. With these few words, I conclude my speech. Thank you once again. <coughs> Sorry, Maitri, I had to intrude here for a minute. Um, as usual, I'm so forgetful uh, by seeing <laughs> Madam Mona and Madam Bhagavati on the screen. I just realized what I, what I did. <laughs> so Madam Mona and Vaido Bhagavati uh, together, seeing both of you together, it was very nice. And uh, once again, we all welcome you to this special lecture. Thank you, Maitri, please. Thank you, Madam, for your kind words and for highlighting the life sketch of uh, Bhagavati, sir. Now I'm here to give you all a brief introduction of today's speaker, Professor M.C. Orun Kumar from Manipur University. Though he needs no introduction, but it is a uh, part of this program and it is just a formality. M.C. Orun Kumar is currently teaching social and cultural anthropology in the Department of Anthropology, Manipur University, Imphal, as professor. He is currently the director, Center for Myanmar Studies in the same university. Professor Arun Kumar has worked on different aspects of society and culture, ranging from performing arts to HIV and people with disability. He authored as well as edited a number of books. Notable among these are Violence Against Women and Children, Research Methodology in Anthropology, Health and Health Culture, Northeast Experience, People Living with HIV AIDS, Perspective of Care and Support, and Maxford uh, Dynamics Series of Tribal Studies. In his credit, there are many research articles in the reputed national and international journals. His writings in Manipuri dailies and monthlies are well known for critical examination of Manipuri society. He is also known for his documentary films and dramas on different social themes like gender issues, tribal life, and cultural history are widely acclaimed. He has more than 20 educational films and short films to his credit. Some of these were awarded as best films in UGC consortium. 
His areas of interest are social problem, methodological concerns in anthropology and gender studies. He is actively engaged in news analysis in All India Radio Infall and also in local cable networks. Now, I would like to request Professor M. C. Orun Kumar kindly to deliver his talk on the topic Inequality and its Manifestations, Anthropological Enquiry. Sir? Good morning, everyone. Respected Vice Chancellor of Divogar University, Head of Department of Anthropology, Divogar University, my senior colleagues, my colleagues, and friends. I still remember that in my college days. Professor A.C. Vakavati was one of our role models. We wanted, from Imphal, we wanted at that time to interact with him, but uh, we, d we did not get much chance. But when time went on, I had some intimate interaction with Professor A.C. Vakavati in different academic forums, including Northeast History Association. I still remember, I'd like to share it with, the, with, uh, with today's uh, August gathering, that once, maybe in late 90s, in Manipur University, we had a seminar on society and religion. Professor Vagavati was part of that seminar. It was closed door uh, seminar of having say, 10, 20 scholars. I read a paper on the Christianization in Manipur, giving the social context where the cookies and the nuggets they became Christianized. Cookies are of southern districts of Manipur and the Nagas are of northern. And I wanted to look at the event or the Christianization in these two different uh, worlds of Manipur. There had been many discussions, many questions, many points, many limitations had been thrown out by many other scholars. But Professor A.C. Vagavati, he did not ask many, uh, much on my, 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 my paper. He asked me, why did not Maite become Christianized? It was, it was, uh, it was like a thunderbolt to me. It, I, never, I, I never thought of it. Maite is a Hindu society, but I never thought why we did not accept it. But I had to give one answer. So I said, religiously speaking, we had three guests coming from outside Manipur. One is Sita with Ram. And when we met Sita, she was so, so docile, so submissive to Rot Ram, her husband. So Manipuri people don't like, is, uh, uh, what I should say, Manipuri women don't like her Sita much because she is so docile, so submissive, so faithful to husband to the patriarchalism in anthropological terms. And Christ came. In Manipuri society, unmarried man is half man. It is not complete man, so we, don't, we did not accept Christ. But when we met Radha, Radha is so aggressive, so, uh, so, so assertive, 
and uh, uh, wanted to play us herself, her, her desire. So Manipuri people uh, like uh, uh, this Radha Krishna and uh, the Vaishnavism, Vaishnavism of uh, this uh, uh, Krishna model, Krishna centric Vaishnavism. That is how I, 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 I answered. And Professor Vagavati just a smile, very, very, very gentleman smile, fatherly smile, I should say. But over a cup of tea, after, 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 after the seminar, after the session, we had a, a, a just, we had a tea break, and over the cup, he said, yes, you should look the things from anthropological perspective, from considering many other factors, so that why people accept Christianity, why people don't accept Christianity, so and so forth. Taking cue from this question, I never, and uh, I, uh, such type of question did not come into my mind before, but after, uh, after that uh, session, I, I uh, taking cue from that question, uh, two of my students walk up in this line. One is the response of Rongme Nagas to the Christianization or Christian conversion. Another one uh, is the, uh, the dialogues between traditional knowledge system and the Christian knowledge or Christian ethics and uh, how these two, two, two systems of thought are interacting. That, that's how uh, uh, and that's how uh, we ha I had a brief interaction with intimate interaction, occasionally, but. But I'm glad to say that, uh, as I mentioned earlier in my school, uh, college days, we, we, we took him as our teacher, as our role model, and I like to uh, share to the gathering that I, took him as my dronacharya and I am his aklevia. I could not get formal education from him directly, but still I take him as my teacher and my guardian. Coming to my uh, uh, topic, uh, it is inequality and its manifestation anthropological inquiry. Here, I will not put any, any theoretical uh, postulation to deal with uh, inequality, or I will not uh, give much, uh, uh, much empirical data uh, uh, relating with uh, inequality. But when we, we think of inequality, the, the ideal form is the equality. Equality, that is equality between two individual, equality between two groups, two groupings, or something, something like that. And uh, there are many thousand anthropological, philosophical, political science, or historical studies on equality and uh, uh, endeavor to, or journey to, uh, to, to attain the uh, status of equality or something like that. It is too ideal, and we all know that there is still we are trying to get equality and we cannot get it even in communist Russia or communist China uh, 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 we could not or we are not getting yet uh, the, the status or the um, equality but inequality is reality it is actual things it is happening all over the world therefore in across the discipline there, had, there are many studies, many discussion on inequality. May it be caste or class. And we, we, we uh, right now we are having uh, discussion or debate on OBC centers, inequality between uh, uh, OBC and uh, this, um, uh, then higher caste, then Dalits, and all that things. So we are uh, discussing about inequality. Inequality in class also, we have uh, come across many studies, many debates, many these things, and uh, gender, of course. Men, women, women are the, uh, the 
we, uh, then there are, uh, say, power differences, then opportunity differences, then difference in or inequality in, in, even in the gender socialization, so and so forth, we, we come across. And very obvious thing in uh, India, today's India, especially in Northern India, is inequality among the ethnic groups the majority, minority, these tribal uh, issues, tribal uh, inequalities, so and so forth. Then racial, that, uh, that is so obvious, regional, this Europe, Africa, America, Asia, or in India, no, uh, say Central India, or Northern India, Eastern India, so, so there are many other uh, aspects of inequality at the level of reason. Then, but one question that comes to my uh, to 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 the mind is that is inequality unavoidable? From here, uh, we we can think of whether we are uh, on on the other hand we are talking about equality and we are trying to get equality equal amongst us, am, among among all the human uh, being among all the human uh, groupings. And uh, so in how we will deal with, how we will see uh, uh, this inequality, how we will perceive this inequality, then the question is, in is inequality unavoidable? It is too negative. Inequality is negative and unavoidable is negative. So there are two two camps in, in, in anthropology as well in, in social science, where one camp is, yes, it is unavoidable. Human being, it should have, cert it should have certain inequality. Equality cannot be attained. It is not, uh, it is unattainable. This is one group, and say, uh, Duberman, he say, in all society, from primitive to really, uh, say, industrial or postmodern society, uh, even in communist nation, inequality is unavoidable. Total inequal, uh, e e equality is unattainable, and to strive for it as a goal, it is all meaningless. This is one stand. And another stand is of the functionalists like uh, Lenski, uh, they, uh, they said that uh, th those who get certain privilege, certain uh, rewards in the society, they, they get these rewards, these, these uh, opportunities or privilege, it is because of the fact that they contribute to the entire uh, society. So they contribute more, so they get more. If you don't contribute or if you, you, if you don't have uh, any position in the society in contributing in the entire functioning of the society, then you will not get uh, much. Those who give more, they get this. This is the functional stand, and therefore in, inequality is a uh, is, is a social fact and it, we cannot wash it out. This is one stand. And uh, uh, definitely, uh, Professor Nitul uh, may uh, remember the work of uh, Louis Dumont, the Homo Hierarchicus. That means, by nature, we live in a hierarchy. We live, uh, we live in a, a pyramid type of society, so if you get more privilege and the larger society have, or the lower stratum, they, they, they get less privilege, less income, less uh, power, so and so forth. So it is, uh, uh, from uh, even from human nature, uh, it is inequality is part of our, uh, our, our society or our uh, human uh, condition. And another group is no. We can avoid. We can avoid inequality and uh, uh, the works of Radin, Lee, or Botley, of course, the Marxists, they say that this inequality is 
because of the subsequent change coming up uh, from uh, coming after the say, primitive commune in uh, classical uh, Marxist uh, terminology. Uh, so they say before the tribal social system were destroyed with the colonial administration. Much emphasis is given on the colonial uh, administration. This society, that is pre pre colonial societies, they were uh, in th th this society provided everyone the material and the social essentials of life. So, if we restore or if we invent certain mechanisms, certain system where the society can or the state can provide all the material and the essentials of life, then this inequality may be avoided. This is one step. And uh, to them is the society progress, the inequality. society. One is inequality between the individuals. And another one is they try to study some, some of the anthropologists, some of the social scientists try to understand inequality in terms of social stratification. And so in a society, in a stratified society, stratification we know this is Upper lower, uh, upper lower arrangement of group things. So, uh, so in a stratified society, uh, in, uh, they try to locate the inequality in terms of the stratum. And uh, earlier, indiv uh, the indivis individual uh, focused studies are uh, something like uh, within the within the st within a single stratum there may be inequality as well as there will be inequality between uh, the two strata. And we can think of between groups, the inequality between two groups, say Ao and Angami, Assamis and Karbis, Boro and uh, uh, something like that. So Maitais and Nagas, so and so forth. So inequality in terms of groups, uh, keeping the, 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 the uh, keeping one group is uh, uh, one whole, another group is another whole, and uh, what is the uh, position uh, uh, between these two groups. This is one focus. Another, then we can think of, if we think uh, the groups, say men and women, or or one ethnic group and another ethnic group, majority or minority. Yeah, yeah, this one. So often we t we 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 d studied between groups. We studied uh, uh, this inequality: man and woman. Men are more powerful. Men are having this that more uh, this and women they are lesser they are second second rate citizens in the society so and so forth that they, they get this uh, or they don't get it something like that majority and minority uh, or ma tribes whites and black this is uh, inequality between the groups but why should not we think within that group there is inequality. Woman, I, woman, or women, let us say, is not homogeneous group. 
we, uh, among the women, there are uh, uh, privileged, privileged women, uh, then underprivileged women, uh, these uh, women, so and so forth. So, in the same society, among the women, there, there may be uh, inequality. So, the wife of uh, chief minister or the uh, say uh, lady, lady minister, um, lady minister of the state is more powerful than the man of lower caste or lower class. So uh, why we should not give more emphasis or why we should not give equal, uh, equal emphasis on this within inequality. Within the group, there is inequality. Likewise, contemporary tribal society is no longer uh, egalitarian in nature. In the tribal society itself, now in the contemporary world, in the contemporary India even, except a few of Andaman and Nicobar, and a few of, uh, say, uh, Jharkhand, and a few of, uh, um, say, Kerala, uh, all other tribal societies in India. Almost all the tribes in northeastern India, they become stratified society, meaning there is inequality in the tribal society. Then, when we, uh, why we should keep only on the group inequality, between group inequality, why we should not give some more emph uh, emphasis on the within inequality, within the group inequality, this is uh, one question that came to my mind. Inequality is very vast subject, so I will not be able to cover everything and uh, to, to, to look at the, the manifestations of inequality, so I tack up only one dimension, and which is very familiar with anthropology, that is tribe. Tribe, usually we assume that it is egalitarian society, meaning no stratification. There may be certain ranked societies among the tribes. It may be ranked society, but it is not stratified society. Usually we think that it is homogeneous and it is egalitarian and they small in number. And uh, sometimes we look at or we define tribe in terms of evolutionary states. We try to look at tribe in, uh, in uh, evolutionary schema. So from tribe to this, to that, to that, or something like that, that uh, Morgan and other, even the Karl Marx um, try to give this evolutionary uh, location of tribe. Then some other, in many literature, today's contemporary literatures on uh, tribe, we take it as transitional phase. Tribe is a transitional phase between this and this. Transition means from this to this. We, we look at as we did in evolutionary uh, schema. Uh, we, we think that uh, this is one stage, this is another stage, and the tribe is in between it. So primitive coming to feudalism, and a tri tribal band may be there, or something, something like that. Then, sometimes in Indian anthropology, we find tribe is a point in the tribe caste continuum. There is a continuum, tribe and caste, and the tribe is, uh, tribe is a point in that continuum. And uh, many Indian anthropologists, including uh, L.P. Vidarty and many others, they, they, they use this uh, tribe caste continuum or something like that. And uh, uh, the, even some of in, uh, anthropology of Northern India try to examine this uh, tribe caste continuum in context of Northern Indian um, tribal scenario. And uh, sometimes, or many times, like, let me say, even including the uh, legal practitioners, they consider tribe is isolated whole. They are isolated community or something like that. And by, by considering tribe as an isolated community, as an isolated society, we thereby 
ignore the contribution of the tribal people to the emergence of civilization. The civ Assamese civilization, Ahom civilization, Maite civilization, civilization of Bengal, many others, even that of great Indian civilization, there had been thousands of tribal contribution. Mahavarta, when I uh, try to, I, uh, with my limited uh, knowledge of Hindi and uh, Sanskrit, I try to study the, the tribal contribution to the big Mahabharatan civilization. So there had been many thousand contributions uh, uh, of tribals to the uh, emergence of this. And if we consider tribe as an isolated whole, then thereby we ignore or thereby we deny their contribution. So we have to rethink whether we should consider them as uh, isolated or is, should we consider them as part of a larger whole? This is one thing. And uh, in contemporary Africa, in contemporary Africa, today's Africa, this tribe is, tribe has the same meaning as nationality used in Europe. So thereby, tribe has no, evolutionary or no civilizational connotation. Rather, they use tribe as the European use nationality, a group of people or something like that. So when we use tribe in Africa, when we use tribe in America, when you use tribe in India, it has different connotation. And in anthropology, how, how we should address, especially of Northern India, where we are, we are, we are having uh, many hundreds uh, tribes, then what connotation we should think of? This is one big challenge. Um, and now, uh, again, in anthropological literature or in anthropological uh, uh, discourse, we assume tribes is being exploited. Tribes are considered as exploited, victim of the exploitation, victim of the colonial rule, victim of the capitalist uh, system, so and so forth. This is one assumption. And we have to test whether this assumption is still, uh, still uh, uh, good or not. And another thing is that another often uh, uh, mentioned thing or assumption is Tribe expo, I uh, sorry, sorry, my <laughs> here, uh, there is some mistakes in my expression. Tribals had been exposed to the uh, colonial, uh, I mean, capitalist system uh, uh, during the colonial rule. That, uh, so this capitalist system brought during the colonial period and tribal had been exposed to that during that uh, during that period. That is fine, historically fine, chronologically fine. But another, on another uh, 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 side of the narration, we have to think Assamese were, the Ahoms were, the Maitais were exposed to the capitalist system during that period. This is also true. So this capitalism or the money economy in many, uh, in different parts of the world, these money economy were introduced during the colonial period by the colonial masters. They brought that system, colonial rules, uh, rulers brought their system, money economy or the capitalist economy to the tribal or non-European societies. So these, these two assumptions big assumption, one is uh, the uh, tribes had been exploited, meaning they had been tortured or exploited by the non-tribal peoples throughout the ages, whether it is uh, right or wrong. Another one is what the impact of colonialism, the impact of capitalism, the impact of money economy had been uh, uh, imposed 
on tribal and non-tribal uh, in different parts of the world, in different non-European societies. So we have to uh, uh, question our own uh, theoretical assumption vis-a-vis uh, -vis the tribes. Another thing is that in, ma in many colonial uh, classical anthropological works on tribes, as I mentioned, we had, uh, uh, we had uh, uh, considered the anthropologies of the colonial period, considered the tribe as isolated and whole, and not considered as a part of larger system in which the tribes are living. This I had uh, then. If we see the colonial anthropologists, uh, 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 their works, then we will find that they did not examine the pre-colonial system uh, holistically. Say, let us take Nuer, Dinga, the Purum. Professor Nitul is here. He is one of the Purum masters, and he had contributed uh, to the study of kinship system among the Kurums. Anyway, I, I like uh, your work on kinship. This he does, he considered Kurum as a whole society, isolated. Surgically isolated, if in a different space and a different time. He did not consider it is in Manipur. It had, Purum had close link with neighboring tribes like that of the Maring, that of say, uh, Chote or many others. He considered Purum and the uh, focus. And uh, in, in uh, say, mass media, in film language, we're extremely close up studies of Purum. But one thing, uh, I still remember that there is one, uh, one sentence in uh, Tisi Das Purum is that they have their own God and deities in religion, but they also worship Krishowa. Krishowa. It is Krishowa is derived name of Lord Krishna. And he missed the point. He missed. Uh, he focused, so he just l left that sentence, keep alone. How this Krishowa come, the concept of Lord Krishna, the, Krishna uh, the, the concept of interactions between the tribal and other tribals, tribal and other non-tribal civilizations, he just left, uh, and he just kept there. So, and you will uh, remember, uh, 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 I think uh, many of senior colleagues know better than me that uh, this is thus did fill work in between, say, uh, 31 and 36, in late 30, uh, I mean, in 30s of 20th century. And he published that letter in 1940, something like that, late 40s or early 50s. In between, before his field work, we experience First World War. First World War did not come here. But many of our tribal peoples, many of the Maitais people, many of the colonial people had been dragged to the British or the colonial armies. It affected the entire social and the cultural system of the uh, of northern India or of Manipur, even that of Uru. And we experienced physically the Second World War in 1940s. He did not consider that. Likewise, Nuer. While this book was written, there had been African independence movement. And that African national movement 
produce a new a new aura of african nationalism a new aura of identity formation but ivan prisa even that of lucy mayer they didn't know when ivan prisa studies the new year he focus on much on new year and uh, keep little emphasis on new year's relation with dinga the the neighbors then many others how uh, the the uh, lucy cookie clans or tado cookie all that lacker you mention any book which had been written during the colonial period by colonial anthropologists that don't they did not give much emphasis on the space the system the larger system in which the tribes are living therefore whether we should look into that so that we can understand the contemporary social inequalities within within the tribals between tribal and non tribals or between tribal and the tribal so and so forth then we had been just assuming things without doing much scientific studies we had been talking about pre colonial tribe one theoretical uh, projection had been given by scott in his art of not being governed and it uh, he gave uh, he he gave the concept of jumias that means the tribes had ran away from the state system because state impose much more on the tribal people on the people let us say on the people to extract the state revenue and the tribal people these tribal people so called tribal people today they had been they had ran away from the state system and the state tried keeps on changing because state has to mobilize the revenue for maintaining the state system you can imagine how a home kings expanded their territory up to golaghat up to up to the uh, 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 up to the border lands of bengal and assam they ha- they had fought with say many tribes or even of shan and others so they require so much resources from where they would they might have mobilized that is one thing like that the burmese kingdom of north no, uh, upper brahma central brahma or uh, uh, lower brahma the kings they might have uh, exercised their powers to extract resources from the people and uh, some people might have ran fr- uh, ran away from the state system from the capital from the uh, from the territory and the state chased them so that they can uh, they could get more resources that is how many people live in deep jungle in the hilly terrain this is how scott explain in his concept of jumias or in his book art of not being governed this is anarchist theory but we still have a theory then should we study them as an isolated one isolated society isolated community karvi has nothing to do with assamese people moran has nothing to do with or uh, this apatani has nothing to do with uh, uh, other 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 tribes should we study in that way or should we study this tribal as a part of larger pre colonial system should we reconstruct that so that we can understand the legacy or the in- colonial intervention in our intertribal or intercaste or the relation between tribe and the non tribes this is one is then 
then in between in quality, trivial and the majority, and in our anthropological literature, if there is question of inequality, we consider this is Sonawal Kasaris, this is Assamese, this is a home, and we, 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 we take certain uh, variables like that of uh, health, chest guard, or something like that, and we study variable-based studies. It may be relating with your health condition, or income, or educational uh, level, or power, etc. But we never give much emphasis in such type of studies. We, d we don't give much emphasis on the process. Process of becoming. Process of being this. And neglect the inequality in the majority. When we study the Assamese and the tribes, Maitai and the Naga, Maitai and the Kuki, May, uh, Kuki and the Naga, so and so forth. We give much emphasis, emphasis on this group. And they, they blame, oh, they, they say, eh, they, they, will, they will blame the majority. These Assamese, these Bengalis, these, the, the Gurkhas blame Bengalis. Many, uh, many tribes, plain tribes blame Assamese or Ahoms to some extent, the Maitais, because they are the majority. In India also, they blame the majorities. But do we have time? Do we have that energy to look into the inequalities within that majority? Ma in, within majority, you will find uh, so many inequalities, so many gaps between rural and urban. Within the rur uh, rural, you will find some families enjoy more, they have more income than many are landless, many are agriculture labor, so and so forth. So while we study the inequality between two uh, ethnic groups, or majority and the minority groups, then often we forget to examine the inequality within that uh, majority, so-called majority. And we neglect this uh, space within the state, spaces within the space. And thereby, you will know, uh, as I mentioned, the lower Assamese people are uh, are having less power than rich or uh, say borough, borough ministers or Kasari ministers or many others. Therefore, how, how we should study this uh, inequality within the state spaces? Karvi minister is much more powerful than a Gogoi peasant, I think, I think so. So th there is no, uh, no necessary to prove it empirically even. Then within inequality, that is majority has within inequality throughout history. Since the, since the Maitai state was formed in 33 AD, since a home kingdom was established during 13th century. Since then, a system, a state system means a system of inequality. You, you, can, you can't expect a home kings to be, uh, uh, to be uh, say, of equal status with peasant. There is, there is a hierarchy. With my nil, uh, limited knowledge of a home administration, they have kings, some nobles, Gogoi, Bezborua, Boroborua, many others. These are question of hierarchy, meaning these are question of inequality in power, as well as if you have uh, inequality in power, it is evident that you have inequality in income and wealth. So why we forget this? while dealing with inter, 
tribal or inter uh, inter ethnic group for in uh, instability this is one and contemporary tribes except you few now are no longer agrarian rather they becomes stratified Tech, if you go to gawati i think many of us went to gawati hmm. we are familiar with gawati and in gawati you will see all electrical this wi-fi communication or wi-fi this borrow automobiles so and so forth meaning is that no longer we cannot consider tribe is just jumias the uh, shifting cultivators you cannot take it it is more exposed even they are some of the tribal individual are more exposed to the capitalism to the let capitalism to the uh, what oh, what i should say liberal uh, liberal uh, economy much more than many of the majority people so there is uh, we should consider this one this fact is uh, we should consider this fact also another try uh, another thing is that within the tribe you will see the emergence of tribal middle class in dimapur in kohima in itanagar even in divgor you will find this you will feel the presence of tribal middle class tribal elites tribal entrepreneurs capitalist entrepreneur i am i am saying and then we have to think of the chip what chips are doing in tribal world today in manipur the entire land belong to the tribe and the sole owner in some part sole owners are the chips and the same in other parts chief in council are the sole owner of the land on land ownership is different and there is democratic process of this election all that things then tribal mlas are there tribal uh, say uh, adc uh, chairmen are there and chiefs are there what chiefs are doing what is the role of chief in today's democratic system i have seen these days i have seen many cases dealing with tribal problems in northern india may it be mar may it be au may it be konyak or nisi or apatani so and so forth they still consider chief is the center of the tribe that uh, universe of that tribe which is not so sometimes chiefs are power brokers chiefs are the power balancer chief and the mls they live in power symbiosis so and so forth being an anthropologist should not we study this position of the chiefs it may not be homogeneous no doubt the, the, there may be differences uh, uh, in different uh, states of india or of uh, uh, northern india still we 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 have to uh, look at these chiefs because their traditional role had been challenged by colonial administration as well as the modern indian system therefore we have to look at relook at the position of the chief another another question that come to my mind when uh, the question of chiefs come whether they are the social barriers to the democratization of tribal peoples why tribal peoples are not fully democratized in democracy we say everyone equal to every uh, uh, everyone 
we are all equal. My father is equal to me. I am not byproduct of my mother and father. I am equal to my father. It is not question of crossing over in cell division. When I attain the age of 18, I am as equal as my father. This is, this is the democracy in, in, in a lighter van. Then, whether this democratization is fully done in tribal, tribal world, especially of Northern India, and that of Jharkhand, or that of Satisgarh, we have to rethink that also. And in colonial world, another equation we will see. In Rwanda, mo most of us are familiar with the ethnic crisis between uh, Hutu and uh, uh, Tutsi. In, in pre-colonial period, 14% of Tutsi minority, they control everything. And but the thing is that these two group, Tutsi and the Hutu, they speak same language, they have same culture, they have same religion as we understand by these terms. And sometimes if poor Hutu, majority Hutu, having less power, less wealth, if they become more richer than they may become Tutsi. That means rich Hutu is Tutsi and uh, poor Tutsi is the Hutu. This was the equation in, in pre-colonial period, but when colony, colonial, colonialism comes, Belgium colony comes, then what happened? They divide this Hutu and the Tutsi into two distinct identity on the basis of nose and the cranial skin, this, that. So taking some physical feature, they divide it and they stop the organic link between Tucci and uh, Hutu. That, that, that picture, please see it. And uh, please see our neighbors, how these colonial uh, rules and the uh, post-colonial administration in India disturb our previous organic link between the ethnic groups. And in tribe in post-colonial India, there are many tribal development programs, this and that we all know. I will not repeat that, but two, on certain principles, based on certain principles, that may be equality, that may be democracy, that may be some other. Based on these principles, we have these tribal peoples, especially the settled tribes, have two powerful schedules in Indian constitution. That is fifth schedule and the sixth schedule. Fifth schedule is Sixth schedule is of the tribes living in undivided Assam. I emphasize the word undivided Assam. And the fifth schedule is of the tribes of central India. Okay? And we have special provisions in Indian constitution like that of Article 371. And the 371 is, we all know, has 371A to J, 371J. So it covers Himachal, Nagaland, Assam, Meghalaya, this, that, we have uh, even of Manipur, we have 371A, B, C, D, like that. Manipur, we have 371C. Based on certain, uh, uh, certain uh, democratic principles. That is fine. But the thing is that where, uh, we should think that whether these principles on which these schedules and uh, these articles, special articles, are still 
reliable are still useful or should should we change it or we should not change it we have to re-examine it so while working our constitution in the constituent assembly especially of this day september 6 1949 we had uh, this uh, there are many uh, advisory committees are there and one committee is uh, dealing uh, was dealing with uh, fundamental rights minority and the tribal and the excluded areas one advisory committee was there and uh, under that we had two uh, uh, two important sub uh, sub, uh, sub sub committee uh, one is dealing with north east frontier tribal areas and assam excluded and partially excluded areas subcommittee had that why our honorable Gop gopinath bodoloi another one is excluded and partially excluded area apart from those in assam that means the rest of the country and it was headed by avi thakar and these two the recommendation of these two committee the first one uh, the, the last one that is of Tucker's, it is the resultant is the fifth schedule and the, the recommendation of Bodolois uh, committee is the uh, sixth schedule. Actually, they were examining whether the concept of schedule excluded, partially excluded, all that things that had been associated with the Constitution of 1935. Whether it will be appropriate to incorporate with the upcoming Indian Constitution of Independent India. It was the mm, duty of uh, uh, these working committees. And luckily or surprisingly, I don't know what what executive I should use or some adverb I should use, I don't know. But before passing, before adopting Article 14, that is, that deals with equality. Before passing Article 14, we had already incorporated fifth and sixth status. Before doing any exercise on the concept of inequality and others, this is one. I don't know what they did. And what is that? Yeah, in the debate, in the debates of constituent assembly, uh, uh, I think uh, mm, there are there were two conflicting views. One is that Bodolois, the, the, uh, this, the, 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 the major question is tribal should be given special power or independent power to them or not. And the Bodoloi said autonomous district councils should be given in order to educate. This term educate, the word educate is not supplied by me it is used in that debate to educate that people in the art of self-government. So, as I mentioned, is they had been perceived as the victim of exploitation, as if they did not know anything about the modern, modern, modern uh, state system. They should be given a special provision only for them and uh, they should allow to, to, to self-rule them or to administer them through autonomous district council or something, something like that. Mean only for them. This is one. Another MP, honorable MP, I don't know who is he, where from he was elected, I don't know, this Gurumini Kumar Choudhury and uh, some other, maybe from Assam. He is Bengali, I think. He is Assamese. Oh, I don't know. But while reading that, I, I think, oh, he, uh, I, it, it, it was just my imagination. And anyway, 
uh, thank you, madam, uh, this Rohini Kumar Saudhuri. He was against the Bordeaux uh, arrangement, as well as the arrangement of fifth schedule and sixth schedule. He said that if you like to empower the tribal peoples, why don't you give the uh, uh, local self-government itself? Local self-government itself, panchayati system itself, could be given to the tribal people, and they will rule in their own way. Panchayat does not mean that pe uh, uh, people from Gauhati, people from Calcutta will come to Kohima. It is not that. Then why you give autonomous district council? Why not the local self-government uh, as we have in other parts of the country? This is uh, Saudhuri's standpoint. So there had been two, uh, two conflicting views in the assembly, constituent assembly. And there comes uh, 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 this question of assimilation. In the constituent assembly, they use this word assimilation rather than integration. In the constituent assembly of 1949, they did not much, they did not know much about the people of Manipur and the people of our neighboring countries at that time. Therefore, they had certain limitation in their knowledge of these tribal people or these tri uh, our neighbors. They did not know. But the question is that if you allow them to rule in separate spheres of power, then the integration of these people would be impossible. This is one stand. And what was the intent of the law? What was the intent of our constitution maker? Tribals are less developed, did not have modern knowledge to adapt to the modern political economy. Therefore, tribals should be given some special uh, consideration, some special arrangement. This is one. And their assumption intent is that law is the instrument for social change and hence tribal development. And protection and the other positive or affirmative discrimination will lead to tribal empowerment and educate them to participate in the state institutions. Then, as I, s I mentioned earlier, today the tribes is no more a homogeneous group except a few. A few means a few living in Andaman and uh, Nicobar Islands. And a class society based on wealth, capital, and power is, become, uh, is, uh, is developed and uh, immersed in the tribal world, and you will notice empirically that there is a gap between the members of the tribes and this gap becomes wider and wider. Then what happened? There is more focus on instability, uh, inequality between the groups and uh, less emphasis on within the uh, inequality, uh, inequality within the group. So between inequality is more emphasis and less space, uh, emphasis is given on within. And the entire tribal society keeps on changing with the emergence of tribal middle class. Then this ethnicity
right there. Mm -hmm. So this ethnicity comes, and uh, uh, and I see ethnicity as a new form of tribalism. This tribal in tribal world today is in post-colonial period. You will see two processes of uh, two processes. One is detribalization. The tribal become a tri the tribal society, tribal individual. Is they are well educated. The, is they have more po uh, power and uh, more wealth. They like to detach themselves from the tribal identity. We are no longer a tribal people, and uh, the, with the influence of globalism, uh, globalization and uh, Christianization, they like to uh, behave like a Western or like an English gentleman, I should say. And another one is that in the urban centers, is they live in the urban center, is they, 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 are, they are far away from their tribal setting. They like to assert that I am different from Assam is uh, middle class. I am different from Maitai middle class. So I am a new middle class, belong to Tangkul or belong to Apatani or so and so forth. So there is a sense of tribalism. Be their identity based on their root and some and is they are change tribe they like to detest them so there is a paradox of this tribalism and detribalization and with this a new sense a new political movement a new political feeling that came up is ethnicity and Ethnicity in anthropological literature are explained with mainly with two broad theories. One is of primordialism, another one is instrumentalist. And one and they try to from bar to many others, they try to explain this ethnicity from limited theoretical framework of primordialism as well as of instrumentalism. But we all know that ethnicity is not scientifically determined variables, scientifically determined uh, phenomena. It is not. Therefore, we should look. Ethnicity is a factor of political choice. The tribal peoples with their newly formed feelings, newly formed emotion, newly formed sentiment, newly formed niche for wider political space, they develop this ethnicity and it is a factor of political choice. And, and this ethnicity, it is so powerful. It is new religion, I should say. It is modern political religion. And it is so more powerful. And there is the beauty of ethnicity is that the, the, the concept of uh, ethnic identity is so fruity. It is just like a fruit. So what happened? Uh, you will see formation of new identities like Jalerong in Manipur, Nagas of 19th century, and in 25th century, the formation of uh, frontier Nagas formation, these, uh, many other, many more. So this ethnic identity, then identity of Zhou people, comprising from say, uh, uh, Arkan Yoma to uh, Chin Hills to Manipur to uh, some portion of Nagaland, or so and so forth, entire Mizoram, so and so forth. 
Kasar, some Kasar districts, some part of the Kasar district, so on and so forth. This is the frigidity of uh, ethnicity, and it is more powerful. So, and uh, if we study them, then you will see the ethnic fusion and the fusion. <laughs> And you will see a formation of different ethnic identities. And what then? This is very powerful. And you will see in ethnic city, ethnic awareness, ethnic consciousness, and ethnic demands for many, many, many things. Then, this powerful phenomenon, what is the driving force? Indian national movement, independence movement led by Gandhi or so, so and so forth, the driving force was love of independence. The driving, there are, in history, there are certain driving force. What is the driving force of these uh, uh, ethnic movements? Which is based on the inequality between two groups or between two classes of separate groups. Whether it, it may be between two groups broadly, if we look into the matter, you will see it is between two groups. But if you look closer, then you will see one class of one group and the same class of another group. And you can say, it may be, it may be, I'm not quite sure, it may be between the middle class of two different things. Why not upper class? Because in tribal society, we don't buy upper class. Upper class lies outside the group. Therefore, it is always between two middle class. And then I will come, I will try to conclude from this point is that considering all what I mentioned in earlier slides, some demands on, some new demands on anthropology are the inequality between tribal and non tribal has been mainly studied as category-wise comparison. We consider them as a category. Ao is a category, Angami is another category, Asami is, is another, uh, this one, Sonowal Kasari is another category, so and so forth. In Divogor University Library, we have so many works considering this tribe as categories. And uh, then we study health, we study uh, the, uh, TV, we study disease, so and so forth. Then uh, some knowledge of HIV or so and so forth, considering how is a category or some, uh, Kasari is a, or Mar is a category. Analysis of the processes that produce ethnic voices rather than the voices themselves. Our new demand is we have to see the process that produce the ethnic voice rather than the analysis of these voices. The analysis of voices, it is done by political scientists, by historians, by say, other, other disciplines of social science. But as an anthropologist, we have to see the mechanism, we have to see the processes by which these ethnic voices are produced. This is a new challenge to us, not. And another demand is that we have been much familiar with the concept of culture is shared shared by a group only. Culture is group specific, society specific. But in today's sensing world, what happened? In Gauhati, let us assume one thing. In Gauhati, 
one Assam born Manipuri man is reading same newspaper, watching same soap opera, belonging to same sports club, buying the same commodities, going to same office or establishment, sharing same value system with his Assamese, Bengo, uh, Bengali, or Boro, or even Mizo neighbors, or friends, rather than with his long distant relatives living in a village in Manipur. So, a Manipuri in Gauhati, his share value is more akin with the uh, Assamese, Bengali, Boro, Marawari, this, that, in Gauhati. Then, what is the, what is the, be uh, this is a basic challenge to our concept of culture. When we say culture, we say it is a shared. It should be shared by the members. But the Gauhati Manipuri share with me only 5%. But with Bengali or with Assamese, 90%. That 5% is also the product of the globalized, like love of A pop and all others. So, this concept of shared values, shared norms, all that things, it should be restudied again in the context of today's world. Another thing, another challenge is that I still don't have, uh, that we have to have a new theoretical paradigm. We have to have a new theoretical uh, framework with which we can study these inequality. And we have to follow a new classification. We are still following the older colonial classification of people of India or the people itself. And we need to develop a new classification of society, a new classification of culture, a new society, uh, I mean, classification of race and all others. All human society, all human culture, all human feelings should be reclassified so that we can accommodate or we can differentiate the similarities and the divergence among the uh, uh, human groupings. That means we need a new tools for analyzing. New tools, then we need to re-examine the interests of different middle class. It is not the tool, but the area of focus we need to think is that. And I will quote, or I will uh, come, to, uh, come back to Rohin Kumar Saudhuri, to him, he said, this hatred, in 1949 he used the word hatred, but today I think it should be, it would be, I would, to, if I have to say today, then I will say ethnicity. This hatred, on this part of tribal is a thing invented by interest, interested person. This hatred, this ethnicity, this feeling of tribalism, or this feeling of non-tribalism, anti-tribalism, all these are invented by inter interested person. In colonial period, it may be somebody else, but in post-colonial period, it may be some other fellow who are following the legacy of the colonial classification, colonial administration. Formerly, that means in pre-colonial period, formerly there were intermarriages. He tried to mean uh, intercaste or intertribal or tr between tribal and non-tribal marriages between tribal and non-tribals. This hatred being continued by interested person. This had been observed in the Constituent Assembly 
divert by doing command show doing. And uh, this, uh, you may call it ethnicity, this word in parentheses is mine. I supplied that. And then, one thing is that we studied the impact of many tribal programs, many sub, I mean, tribal subplan and uh, many tribal schemes and uh, programs in applied anthropology. Considering this model, these programs, this scheme is the point of start, starting point. And we study the impact of that point. Now my, my question is, we have to re-examine that point also. Considering these laws, these programs, these uh, scheme should be considered. The schedules, sixth schedule, fifth schedule, article 371, A to Z, all these things should be considered as, as input, social or cultural input. Please study Article 371A. That deal with Nagas. B, that deal with Assam. Please take Article 371A or B or C or anything, or all of them. Please consider them as cultural input or social input. And we have to study, we have to see we have to address how these chains of exclusiveness or exclusive concept of inequality and we can understand the entire picture of, entire dynamics of inequality. This is what I feel and coming to conclusion, N normally, normatively, anthropologists study the normative order. How these are doing, how these parts are functioning, what this unit contribute to the whole, so and so forth. So we don't like to study the chaotic situation. Therefore, there are less, I don't say no, but less literature on social problems or social deviance or inequality, so and so forth. We don't have this uh, much literature on these things because they are far away from the normative or the habitual uh, things of habitual uh, conduct of uh, anthropologists. So inequality is one of the major issues Inequality, as I said, it is actual thing, and it causes many other social problems. Therefore, we have to address it. And uh, how an anthropologist would contribute to the understanding and uh, towards the solution of inequality problems, we have to see uh, uh, this inequality as a product or as a cause of many other social and political processes. And as a new phenomena of ethnicity and association emerge in human groupings, anthropology requires to examine self. Likewise, if we, if before thanking <laughs> all of you, I, uh, this model of this, the, uh, the entire thing, the entire uh, uh, theoretical stand that I have, it can be applied. I, I don't. I don't say that uh, it should be applied only to the uh, ethnic tension or ethnic relation. It can be also considered uh, in in the study of say gender. If we study men and women inequality, we feel men and women. Why we should not study the women themselves and the inequality between the women and the entire picture will be quite different from
from the mere study between between inequality, study of between inequality. So with these few words, I like to thank all of you for patient hearing and uh, I would like, I would love uh, to get your uh, feedback, your question, your critical um, observation via email, I should say. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir, for your thought-provoking uh, talk on uh, and for highlighting the key issues and methodological concerns as well as the demands uh, that arise during the studies of uh, inequality in the changing dimensions of society. And for stimulating us uh, with the question that is inequality uh, unavoidable or avoidable. Uh, thank you so much, sir, for your uh, gripping talk. Now. Now I would like to request uh, Madam Purnima Bhagavati, uh, wife of uh, uh, AC Bhagavati sir, kindly to share a few words on this occasion with us. And we are extremely delighted that Madam is with us today. Madam, can you hear me? Purnima Baidu. Madam Apunar Matu Ahane, Ami Huna Puane. Madam Apuni Ama Huna Paisene. Baidu? Uh, we have amongst us a uh, daughter of a uh, late Professor Noda Charan Bhagavati, uh, sir, um, Madam Moana Bhagavati. Okay. Moana Baidu? Can you hear us? Hello. 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 Please bear with us. Due to technological issues, uh, Madam Purnima Bhagavati and Moana Bhagavati are unable to join with us. So let us wait a few little moment.
Madam Moana, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, now I can. Okay, thank you. But I lost you in between. I lost uh, the conversation in between. But now I can hear. Okay, thank you, Madam. Uh, now I would like to request uh, Madam Purnima, uh, Purnima Baidu to say a few words on this occasion and, uh, and share um, her experiences with us on this occasion. Dibrugar Bisto Bitello and Nitato Vivar of Hat Uposti Uposaito, Tatamu Kotiti, Bikisto Utiti Hokol, Kormo Porta Hokol of Hat Nimontito Anan Posti Utiti Hokol Aji A. Smithy Saran of Hat Muguakar Kobolo Quat Tainava Jonasu Osakota Kobolo Gule my Punu Hoba committed Hafondiar, Ubikotan Nai. A Duakar, Koi Hamordi Maibo Kurisi. Tibudukarot, Ami Notabos or Kotaisilu. Tetia Nitoto Bibagor, Bohutu Hikok, Hikoeti, Satro Satri Hute, Eta Gurua, Homporko Gori Utisi. Tibrugor Ediaha, Ajipre Hatotris, Atotris Bosor, Parvegul, Case Miti, Aju Pahoribo Puramen. Aji Tini Bosor Dori, Mur Shami, Sorgio Nodasaran, Hagobati, Smithy, Bokita Unustantu, Patio Havisi, Tarbabe, Tiburugar Bishobidaloi, Aru Nitota Vivarok, Mui Oki, Tainaba Janesi. Ekini Koye, Moyagi Hamuribo Kurisu, Tainaba, Namaskin. Thank you so much, Baido. Uh, for your kind words and actually without you this uh, program is actually incomplete uh, thank you madam and now i would like to request uh, madam moana bhagavati daughter of bhagavati sir kindly to share a few words with us um thank you very much um, um at the outset i would like to uh, express our deepest gratitude and appreciation to uh, Dibrugar University, um, the acting vice chancellor, also the chief guest for today's function. Uh, the Department of Anthropology, Dibrugar University, uh, led by Professor Nitin Kumar Gogoi, um, and all the faculty members. Um, the distinguished guests present today, many of whom uh, have been like our family, the young research scholars and students. Um, on behalf of uh, my immediate family, um, led by my mother who spoke just now, and uh, my brother, Dr. Nirbal Kumar Bhagavati, who is currently in Washington, DC. He was unable to attend this um, very important occasion because of the time difference. Uh, my husband Ashish Vachani and daughter Nayana Vachani who are currently in New Delhi. And my extended uh, family, the Bhagavati family, many of whom may have wanted to join today but were not able to for various reasons. We deeply commend uh, this initiative uh, started by the Department of Anthropology, Dibruga University. Uh, it is no mean feat. Um, and speaks volumes of the commitment and the love that all of you have for my dear departed father. This is the third year in a row and, um, and this cannot be held without a lot of background efforts, very, very sincere efforts and a fine sense of commitment. And I'm sure my father, wherever he is, will be deeply appreciative of these efforts. Um, a special word of thanks to Professor M.C. Arun Kumar for leading us into a fascinating uh, study come lecture on inequality. And um, 
I am kind of unfortunate that due to technical reasons, I could not follow the entirety of your lecture, Professor Arun Kumar. However, I was glued uh, to the slides on screen, so I hope I have not really missed all the finer details. And uh, your study um, is fascinating uh, to a non-anthropologist like me. Uh, my basic training has been in economics because your study dwelt and your lecture uh, based on i'm sure on decades of study dwelt at length on economic uh, issues and issues also of political science so in a sense this was an interdisciplinary lecture and uh, it was truly illuminating i think befitting your initial words mm -hmm. of father and how he has made um you know, made us and all of you think through certain, uh, uh, not even evident facts. So thank you very much once again. Um, I just want to uh, say a few words here that, um, that I was introduced uh, to Manipur, Imphal in particular, uh, by my father. Um, it was over a decade ago that um, he and I went to uh, Imphal together. He was a sprightly 75 plus, almost 76. And as many of you would uh, know and appreciate that age never deterred my father. So I spent about four days in Imphal. I must have uh, met uh, Professor Arun Kumar also. My father took great pride in introducing his extended family of uh, colleagues and students and young, uh, you know, young students and researchers to us in the family. So all of us almost became like a family. So um, I, I spent a few days in Imphal with him and he really took me on like a guided tour. And uh, he also uh, uh, followed me to Tamu. Uh, I was doing a, uh, a Tamu and More and then over to Tamu because I was at that point doing a cross-border um, uh, uh, study on uh, informal trade flows. And uh, what I do remember is that here I was uh, doing a study, but here was my father doing his own anthropological study. And he was just so fascinated because he had not in his decades of work had not crossed over from Moray to Tamu. So that was a new uh, beginning for him as well. Um, uh, so yes, so I was introduced to Manipur uh, through my father. I also want to extend um, you know, uh, my appreciation or our appreciation rather from the family side on, on, the, on what Professor Gogoi mentioned as a commitment of the department to have the annual lecture on the 26th of October. That was the day uh, 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 my father breathed his last on 26th October, uh, a, a late afternoon. And um, for many reasons, and of course, all of them emotional, I, I desist or we as a family uh, desist um, from keeping any occasion, but it would be so befitting if De Brugge University and the Department of Anthropology uses this day to hold the annual memorial lecture. Uh, on the other hand, um, uh, we take 20th of September, uh, which was his date of birth, as the day to commend and to, to remember the legendary contributions of my father, and not just in the anthropological field, but also, uh, you know, in a very social and familiar and a familial way. And let me just give a recent example of how we celebrated his birthday this year. As many of you are know, uh, are aware, and uh, Kolyanda, Dr. Kolyan Borua is sitting amidst you. Uh, we marked his birth uh, birthday last year with the launch of a book which was edited by uh, Kolyanda, uh, Dr. Kolyan Borwa, Purbatar Himalaya. That was a very successful launch that was on 20th of September last year. This year on the 20th of September, uh, we set forth to fulfill uh, his desire, which he was expressing uh, in the last, especially in the last uh, few months 
of his life when he was ailing and no longer able to move around. And what was this wish? It was that um, he wanted to donate books and two bookcases to a public library uh, in his ancestral village. Um, my father was born in Silet, um, which was then part of Assam, uh, now currently in uh, Bangladesh. Um, uh, but, uh, you know, he, he was not born in, uh, in his, uh, in, in Nalbari district, he was born in Silet, but his ancestral village is a, uh, is a village called by the name of Bali, uh, which is about uh, four kilometers away from Tihu in Nalbari district. And my father really longed uh, to go there in the last few months of, uh, in the last few months, that is in 2019. And he wanted with this very specific purpose, um, but that never came to be. Uh, so he was ailing for a few months. And as many of you know, he was, um, he was uh, sort of uh, 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 tied to his, uh, you know, he needed help in the last four months. Uh, and, and hence, this 20th of November, uh, it was our desire to fulfill this wish of his. And uh, that we did with a lot of support and organizational planning uh, from some distant relatives in his village. Um, we went there on the 20th morning. We donated 100 books. Um, all of it is uh, books in Assamese and a few books in Bangla. And this was specifically uh, to mark um, the family's close association to Bangla language because uh, my father and uh, was born and raised in Silet and he was equally fluent in Bangla as he was in Assamese and uh, English. So we donated these hundred books and um, incidentally, a few copies also of the book, which was released uh, last year. And uh, we donated two bookcases to the public library in, uh, in Village Bali. And uh, what uh, we find very heartening is that um, all across the village, uh, there was such appreciation of this gesture that uh, speaker after speaker uh, stood up to say that nothing like this had been attempted in the village earlier. And that um, the fact that a towering personality like my father, you see um, from the village, as you know, it is only a few people who actually step up and step out and step up uh, in their lives. So they felt um, uh, extremely honored and privileged that uh, my father had made this promise and what's more that the family, uh, myself, my mother, my brother um, and our extended family that is of my, my father's side of the family uh, were equally committed and many members of the family landed there on the 20th and that we could have this public function. Uh, so in that sense, uh, we have uh, tried our utmost to keep um, to, to keep going forward, not only um, uh, with not only with his dreams and desires, but also to keep his commitment um, to to all of us and to keep his commitment perhaps to all of you. Um, there is so much more to say about my father who was actually like my pillar. Um, but yes, um, I think um, one does my mother and my, me, we feel extremely honored and extremely privileged to be part of this um, uh, very um, a deeply fulfilling uh, event that all of you have organized. Thank you so much. Thank you, Madam, for sharing your words. Your words mean a lot to us. And thank you for joining us every year on this occasion. And we solicit your cooperation in the near future, too. Uh, so now we have almost come to the end of today's program. Now I would like to request Dr. Orinita Goswami to deliver the vote of thanks.
a warm good afternoon to the august gathering in the house i dr arindita goswami feel very privileged to stand here today to propose the vote of thanks on behalf of the department of anthropology dibruga university on the auspicious occasion of the third annoda charan bhagwati annual memorial lecture 2023 organized by the department of anthropology dibruga university at the outset i would like to start by offering a heartfelt gratitude to the honorable vice chancellor in charge of dibruga university <laughs> professor jahanabi gogoi nath madam for gracing the occasion with her kind presence in spite of her hectic schedule she had to leave due to her pre scheduled work i would now like to tender our deep sense of gratitude and appreciation to today's speaker professor mc arun kumar sir professor department of anthropology manipur university and director center for myanmar studies manipur university for sparing time from his busy schedule and accepting our invitation thank you so much sir we really had a good opportunity to hear your line of thinking on inequality with its myriad faces and how we can look into it from fresh perspectives we would like to again hear you in the near future i offer our sincere gratefulness to uh, professor nita kolita borwa madam uh, dean faculty of education for her encouraging presence here today although ma'am also had to leave early due to her pre scheduled works a special and deep sense of appreciation goes to the family members of late professor ac bhagwati sir uh, i would like to thank mrs purnima bhagwati madam and moana bhagwati madam for uh, being with us over the virtual mood thank you so much to both of you for your kind presence madam in the last two annual lectures as well as this time uh, which really has been a catalyst for us that has stimulated us to do our best i now offer our sincere gratitude to the enthusiastic retired faculties and staff of our department we have core sir with us sen gupta sir dipanjana madam forida madam uh, mohananda da uh, i thank you all for your encouraging presence with us we also have dr kolyan borua sir retired principal naharkotia college for we thank you sir for your kind presence i am immensely grateful to professor nitul kumar gogoi sir head department of anthropology dibruga university for his constant guidance and cooperation in arranging and conducting today's event thank you sir i'm thankful to all the proactive and dedicated faculties office staffs research scholars and students of the department of anthropology dibruga university as well as the technical arrangement team of our institution and all those who have worked hard behind the scene for their enormous cooperation to make this event culminate successfully last but not the least on behalf of the entire fraternity of the department of anthropology dibruga university i extend our deepest thankfulness to all the esteemed guests from different academic institutions across india who are who have been present with us both physically as well as virtually over google meet and providing us with the much needed encouragement uh i would like to say that we have participants from uh different institutions like dibru college dibrugarh rajiv gandhi university arunachal pradesh arjabidapit college guwahati north guwahati college gc college silchar dudnoi college cotton university and kk handiki state open university thank you to one and all i end with the hope of meeting again in the same platform the next year I also apologize for any inadvertent error on the part of the organizing committee. A light refreshment has been arranged. I request everyone to kindly proceed to the adjacent hall for the same. Thank you. <laughs>